Um, so, to uh, as we've done in the past, uh, we'll recap a little bit about what we have, uh, what you have looked at in the past uh, week. Um, you're basically looking at the energy equation. So, uh, just two seconds to, to talk about exactly the significance of, of that, maybe. So. This normal recapitulation of what's what's going on, and so if I think about the the important things of the the energy equation, um, the, there are two. Well, let's let's write it out in some way. So if you recall, uh, and I'm going to write it specifically this way, we have the normal components of Bernoulli's equation plus a component which represents a pump head. We'll have to be units of length. And this is equal to the same magnitudes uh, downstream. Um, so we evaluate this behavior again at two points. And so what's different in dealing with this from last time is a couple of things that are worthwhile um, remembering. The first is that the normal Bernoulli equation applies. We've seen this before. And this really comes out of uh, conservation of momentum. It's really just a, a, a statement of that. But we have a couple of extra terms. And a couple of extra terms allow us, for instance, to put energy into the system in terms of pump head. All of these individual terms have to be in units of length. But pump head allows us to be uh, positive if a pump and negative if a turbine. So we have a sign convention still. And uh, if we're putting energy into the system to pump something from location 1 to location 2, then the value of the, the head that we apply is positive. Um, if there's an excess of power that we're taking out of the system, then we're generating uh, energy or power, if you like, uh, through a turbine. And so we can get that. The other thing that we have uh, accounted for are viscous losses. So the H sub L, the L is for losses. And it's this um, one directional behavior that pulling something across the table, it gets to another location, and to put it back to its starting point, you have to expend more energy to get it back. So the energy is eaten up in terms of heat, frictional heat in the system, a small amount. And in many systems, it's very important. Otherwise, we have perpetual motion machines. If we don't have frictional losses in pumping fluids out of reservoirs or aquifers, if we don't have frictional losses in pumping uh, stuff along pipelines, that'd be great. Uh, and I, actually, we'd like to minimize those, those losses. Uh, and so when we get into weeks, uh, we're week nine right now. When we get into weeks 10 and 11, we'll talk about uh, friction losses in pipes, which is the essence of uh, some of the stuff we'll do. Not very exciting, I don't think, but it builds on the stuff that we've already dealt with here. Um, and so that's the, the essence, if you like, of the, the outcome of the, the energy equation. Um, I think you could, uh, uh, there are three ways in which we could define the energy equation. The, the first one really was Bernoulli, which is basically the behavior above, which, you know, you look at flow between two streamlines, between points two and points one. By the way, uh, the sign conventions is, is important that this is upstream. And this is downstream. And so we can define it in terms of Bernoulli, and that's perhaps the most useful way in which we have this, uh, this expression defined. We, of course, get the Bernoulli equation through uh, Reynolds transport theorem from Osborne Reynolds. And really, you know, it's just a matter of putting a, um, a control volume 
around something just as we've done in the past and, and solve for it. We have to solve it less that way. This, this is really the one-dimensional equation that we'll, we'll use uh, the most. And if we apply Reynolds transport theorem, say, to a differential cube, which is something that looks like what we've seen before. We've dealt with it for a bunch of different things. Seems scary sometimes, but it really isn't. Uh, Right-hand coordinate system, so that would be uh, something like x, y, and z for our sign convention. Then this would be dx, this would be dy, and this would be dz. And we have fluid flows into and out of this uh, region. We have what are referred to as the Navier-Stokes equation. Which we won't worry too much about, other than the fact to know that they're named for uh, a Frenchman and uh, I guess a, a Briton, an Englishman probably, a Navier and Stokes. Um, it's really the same as applying Reynolds transport theorem, where the control volume just happens to be this regular uh, cubic sided uh, control volume with uh, parallel, plane and parallel faces. And we can do this accounting for energy into and out of the system. And most importantly, it allows us to accommodate these viscous losses. And what we can do with it is we can solve for problems, for instance, to get closed form equations. Whoops. Not for that. We can get closed form equations, for instance, if we looked at the material, for instance, for flow in a pipe as a function of the pressure gradient that gets applied to it over some length. And since we'll use it today, perhaps I'll write it out, and that is that the average flow velocity through a pipe so it's not actually um, a uniform flow velocity because we have these viscous losses at the edge. And so the boundary conditions that we apply are is that, is that the fluid is stuck to the edges of the pipe and has zero velocity. It has the largest velocity in the middle. Typically, we take that distribution and we just try and calculate what this average velocity is, where the area under the curve in each of these cases is the same. And if we do that, then for a diameter uppercase D, the velocity is equal to um, D squared over 32 times viscosity multiplied by the pressure gradient. Bless you. I'll call that uh, D DX. So it can be over any length, any, any length we want. But, uh, so in other words, if we wanted to, this derivative here could be the change in pressure over the change in length, basically. And so uh, it's useful to be able to evaluate that. So to, to get that, we have this differential statement of what the equations are called Navier-Stokes. And most importantly, compared to everything we've done so far, it has this viscous loss term embedded in it. So that was, if you like, a, a summary of what we'll deal with. And so this viscous loss term um, is the essence of what we'll deal with now for, not this week, but next week, next, uh, I guess, weeks 10 and 11, we'll talk about pipe flow. And so the essence of pipe flow is the viscous losses you build up on the inside of the pipe. Um, following that, we'll talk about external flows. So in other words, when you design a car, uh, when you design the Prius, I guess, you'd like to have low uh, air resistance, if you want to be a cyclist that goes fast and sets the land speed record, then you want low air resistance. So we look at viscous losses around a cyclist or around a, a water tower to see if the water tower would topple, but it's the same behavior. Viscous losses is drag on the outside by viscous effects, also pressure losses, uh, to be able to see exactly what the magnitudes of those forces might be, to see what amount of energy is used up. So viscous losses are important to what we'd like to attempt to do. But before we do that, we'll take a slight uh, diversion. Um, 
And the diversion is, perhaps a welcome diversion, is that we'll talk about an incredibly uh, powerful tool in fluid mechanics, which is called uh, dimensional analysis. Uh, and dimensional analysis attempts to be able to use experiments uh, in a clever way to be able to figure out, for instance, what this expression might be. And so, in other words, if we don't have the Navier-Stokes equations and we don't want to solve the differential equations for the appropriate boundary conditions, are we able to come up with a relationship like this for experimentation? And, of course, that's what happened in reality. The equations that define um, frictional losses in pipes were defined experimentally before they were defined uh, analytically with this expression. And so dimensional analysis is basically a way of perhaps doing the minimum number of experiments you can get away with to be able to figure out what the functional relationships say between velocity and pressure gradient that you have to apply in a system to be able to figure out what this... So in other words, if you know, if you would guess that velocity is proportional to change in pressure with length, then the question is, what is this constant that links them? Is there a, f a smart way of us being able to figure that out just by doing some, some experiments? You might remember, if you cast your mind back to maybe the first or second time we met, uh, we talked about the ratios of different forces in fluid mechanics and how uh, we could try and define the dimensions of different properties. Uh, and we went through an exercise to be able to define uh, a few non-dimensional numbers. So we'll come back and we'll redefine and reuse those uh, today. Um, those numbers are the Reynolds number, after Osborne Reynolds, the Froude number or Froude number, and after Leonard Euler, the one scientist or engineer to be on a, a note, a Swiss, a Swiss bill. Um, they are uh, ratios of different forces. Reynolds number is ratio of inertial to viscous forces. Froude number is ratio of uh, velocity forces to inertial forces to uh, gravitational forces, and the Euler number is the ratio of pressure forces to uh, inertial forces, the V squared over 2G term. So don't, don't worry about that for now. Uh, and there's a formalism by which we can figure out exactly how to get these non-dimensional parameters. And it's called, named after another uh, Briton, I guess, Buckingham, the Buckingham Pi theorem. Pi as in the book, the movie, uh, the Greek uh, alphabet letter. So the pi is pi. And so that's where we're, we're going. So let's take a, a brief diversion and look at some of the things that we've normally looked at. We have mo uh, so I saw this. So here we go. See if this will reload. Cannot contact server. Oh, that's not going to work then maybe. Am I not online? Well, okay, we want to... Uh, it's doing something, it's thinking. Oh, yes, yeah, doing something. What do you get with a 600-pound pumpkin, a spoon, and a paddle? Utah's giant pumpkin growers would say you have the perfect boat to float across the Sugar House Pond. Okay. The pumpkin regatta is becoming a Utah tradition, and this year the race sure broke need a to hear world this. record. Here's a look at the annual race. Two qualifiers will take for the final heat to set a world record, a Guinness Book of World Record. We're doing that here today. Um, I predict a, a strong start and a strong finish. Three, two. It's hot off the press. Yesterday. The Brits, the Brits right now, right now hold the world record for, for fastest 100 meters in a pumpkin. He's bringing that stuff home. He's going to come back here today. So, yeah, you can work out what this is. Of course, it's very seasonal. I got this a bunch of plumbers. I was a plumber for 48 years. We got together and decided to see who would grow the biggest one. The first one was 132 pounds. And then 25 years later, 
Who would have thought we'd even got a thousand pounder? Now we got one that's almost breaking the two thousand pound barrier. Welcome, world record holder inductee, and this year's winner, Charles Clark. Charles. There you go. So that's apparently what you do in Salt Lake City on a, a fall afternoon. So, so simple question, you know, if you want to design the, the optimal pumpkin to get across the, the lake in the fastest time, would it be the smallest? Would it be the biggest? Would it have a certain shape to it? How could you do that? Well, you could do that by uh, experiment without knowing too much about, uh, about theory um, and decide exactly between that. Um, if you look at last year's uh, Class, this has gone offline, um, but there is a very nice uh, Nova type program uh, from digging up a, a dinosaur, a dinosaur which of course, of course is not is fossilized uh, after after being buried for a long, long time. And the question was, uh, was this the first flying dinosaur with feathers? And so they made a mock-up of this dinosaur. They put it in a wind tunnel, and they measured the the forces, the ratio of drag to lift on the on the, uh, the reconstructed bird to be able to figure out whether it could physically indeed f fly with the amount of energy it would be able to supply to, uh, to, to move, moving itself. And of course the way in which uh, airplanes would, are, are, were uh, designed and still are to some degree, uh, despite you know, tremendous advances in computational uh, fluid dynamics, is to put a mock-up in a wind tunnel. You put a mock-up in a wind tunnel, you attach some um, sensors to it, uh, you increase the flow velocity across the static plane with the moving wind to represent static wind, static air and a moving plane, and you measure how much force you get versus drag you get, and from that you can scale it in some way uh, from, looks in this case to be almost a full full-size plane, but you can scale it up from being a very small uh, model of a plane, some scale model, correct in every component of it, maybe down to quarter scale or eighth scale or tenth scale or fiftieth scale, measure the forces, and then the question is, how do you take the forces that are apparent, apparent on that model and how do you properly scale them up to be able to figure out exactly what the lift would be so that you can figure out when you put 400 passengers in it whether there's enough lift to be able to take it off the ground. And so that's the basic question to be to, to answer. Uh, and even at a, a more mundane level, as I was walking around at uh, Stone Valley uh, yesterday and uh, saw this was kind of an interesting uh, thing. So Stone Valley is the university's lake. It had a leak in the dam, and so they, they drained it. They're, it's now filling again um, slowly. It's not up to its full height. They used to, be able, used to be able to rent sailboats there, of which some of these are sunfish, just one person, single mast, single sail. Um, dinghies, you know, 10-foot 10, 10 dinghies. And in this, you can see a very fluid, obviously, sailboats are very fluid mechanic -y. Uh But you can see on this sailboat, so this is uh, a self-baler, right? So you're going along, it works on the principles we've had in this class, this happens to be a rock that's sitting on it, but this is a, goes into an orifice in the boat, it's uh, sculpted so there's a cowl on it, uh, you have water flowing past it, so there's low pressure on the back side of it. Low pressure, obviously it's upside down. Low pressure sucks out the fluid from the system. Uh, close up, uh, this is the, the leading edge. Inside here, I think there's one that was broken. So this is what it sits on. It's just a hole in the bottom of the boat. Obviously, if you had a hole in the bottom of the boat, that might be a bit of a problem if you're trying to, to, uh, to sail. But the basic... Um, workings of this are, you can see that these two small prongs are there. Uh, inside it, you can imagine that there's a, a floating ball that sits inside there. The f if we take this off, the floating ball, when it's upside down, will float into this hole and therefore seal it, except when it's going fast enough that there's a low enough pressure on the back side of this that it will suck water <coughs> from the inside of the boat and self bail. So that's how a self-bailer works. So you have to be going fast enough for this Venturi effect to be able to take place. And so how do you design the, the geometry of this to be able to make sure that it would work? So you could do it 
on a full-size boat, and you could do it uh, by dragging it in the water. You could also, conceivably, if you wanted to, you could fit a manometer pipe to the underside of this to measure the pressure in this little orifice, and you could blow air across the top of this sample and measure by blowing air across this what the pressure drop would be. So then the question is, if you're blowing air at one meter a second and you get a <coughs> pressure drop of five um, kilopascals, how does that relate to the velocity you're going in water and the pressure differential that you'd apply and how efficient would that be in terms of being able to suck out water? And so you could do an experiment with a different fluid, air versus instead of water, uh, relatively simply, and then try and make that conversion to be able to understand how it worked with, with water. And so that's the essence of um, experimentation in fluids. So also you could do an experiment with uh, an airplane in a water tunnel, having, air, having water go across the plane, measuring the forces that are applied, and also scale that up to being able to define exactly how that uh, aircraft would uh, behave when you uh, look at flying in air, so which you'd rather do, I guess, rather than flying in water. And so that's what we'd like to attempt to, to do to today. So how do we go about that? We've made the point that uh, the essence of some of the things that we'd like to talk about are these extra terms, uh, viscous losses. So if we're looking at pushing a plane through the air, there's clearly the issue of uh, lift that we'd like to get right, because that's what allows the plane to get off the ground. But there's also, working against lift, you have to physically push it through the air, there's also drag. And so we'll talk about lift and drag in, in due course, but both of those are related to the, the viscous losses that we have in our system. So let's go back to, to talk about exactly how we will look at that. Okay. So this is the, the, the idea. So dimensional analysis really requires that we can define our behavior in terms of some this is a bit oxymoronic in some respects. We want to be able to define non-dimensional parameters. <coughs> want to find non-dimensional parameters that define the response of our system. And typically, uh, those non-dimensional parameters, they fall into being exactly these three parameters that we see here. They end up, then the most important two of them, I would say, are the Reynolds number which is the ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces. And the Euler number, bless you, which is the ratio of uh, pressure forces to uh, inertial forces. So pressure to inertial forces. So of these, uh, by far the most important is Reynolds number. And Reynolds number, we'll come back to this page, but Reynolds number allows us to uh, typically, and it's, this is just found uh, observationally, it allows us to scale flows in some particular way. And so if you look at, for instance, um, this figure which comes out of your book, this is uh, a streak line plot of flow past a, a cylinder. So this is the cylinder outline here. And if you look at the path of a particle that comes here, hits a stagnation point here where the velocity stops along in the direction uh, across the page. But of course it then takes off orthogonal to that and might go around the back side of the cylinder on each side. Hopefully you can see that superimposed. 
But the idea of the Reynolds number uh, is that at any particular Reynolds number, a very low number, there will be a particular snapshot that this will look like. Uh, and this is actually at a relatively high Reynolds number. I'm not sure if I have it written down here. Yeah, a Reynolds number of 2,000. So the Reynolds number in terms of the ratio of these forces, it has an average flow velocity of some magnitude, uh, a density of the fluid of some magnitude, a viscosity of the fluid of some magnitude, and some characteristic length. And typically the characteristic length would be the appropriate dimension of this, you know, be the, the diameter of this. And so if you do have fluid, uh, have water going past this um, cylinder at a Reynolds number of 2,000, or if you have treacle going past this cylinder at a Reynolds number of 2,000, or air going past this cylinder at a, a Reynolds number of 2,000, the format of the flow paths, which in this case has, you see these uh, little turbulent eddies that develop around here. There's one that's being shed off in the past. There's another one here. It'll look exactly the same at any particular. So if you take a snapshot, it'll look functionally the same at, en at the same Reynolds number. If you do it at a Reynolds number of five, it would look quite different. It would look like actually creeping flow. Would look, the flow lines would look just like this. So say Reynolds number, well, say 1. And in a Reynolds number of 2,000, what you have is something that's a bit different, and that is you have this coming here. Uh, you have it breaking into a little eddy here. It's already broken into an eddy here, and there's a previous eddy. So this would be the first eddy that's developed. Then it switches to a, an eddy here, and then an eddy here, and these things all get shed downstream. And although we've not really talked about it, you know, Another one of the first things we looked at, if you remember, was the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, the suspension bridge. Galloping Gertie, as it's called, from the 1950s, and that's exactly the problem. You have a wind velocity uh, of some magnitude, which is a critical Reynolds number that allows, first of all, one eddy to be shed from the top, then one eddy to be shed from the bottom, then one from the top again, and these get carried downstream. And so what these shedding, shedding of these eddies do is it gives an impulse to the bridge, and if that impulse is in exactly the right uh, frequency, that it's the characteristic resonant frequency of the bridge, it sets it in motion, and it grows and grows and grows, and ultimately uh, pulls itself apart. And so it doesn't matter about that. We'll deal with that in due course. But so the only thing is that to be a <coughs> This happens at a particular Reynolds number for the bridge. I don't recall what it is right now. We'll talk about it when we talk about external flows. But that's the mechanism by which this occurs. You get an eddy shed from the bottom, and then the top, and then the bottom, and then there'll be another one shed from the top in a little while later. And these shedding of these eddies give a little push to the bridge, top and bottom. And so that if you remember the, the movie, if you're looking along the bridge, it's actually twisting. It's twisting along its length. It's also kind of got a... a a standing wave in it as well, and ultimately the, the wind velocity, which was constant, ultimately pulled it apart. So you build it differently. You either give it a different mass to the bridge so it doesn't have the same characteristic frequency, and therefore you don't have the problem anymore. But you could do an experiment in the wind tunnel to do that. But the bottom line is that Reynolds number is the parameter that controls this uh, flow regime uh, and we can use that as an important parameter to define our behavior, okay? So, I don't know if you remember when we first uh, broached these, um, but we did it in two, a couple of different ways. And I'll write this very specifically. And so you're, you will remember, of course, Bernoulli's equation. And I'm going to write this in a very specific way, because I can. Uh, and so I guess this is the downstream component. And so to label these terms, we'll call this is our <coughs> the velocity, the momentum term. So momentum, rates of change of momentum, is the same as mass times acceleration, right? 
mass times rate of change of velocity is mass times acceleration. So from F equals MA, this term is the inertial term. This is the pressure term. This is the elevation term, uh, or actually, um, let me not call it that, let's call it the gravitational term. That says gravitational. And these are viscous losses. So these are the, the three terms that we, we have that we, we can deal with. So what are the units of these? You know what the units of these are. They're all in units of uh, length. And so what we could do is we could change that so that we could multiply this through by uh, a magnitude of unit weight divided by length. So the units as these, they stand right now are, are length. But I would like to think about multiplying them through by unit weight of the fluid and maybe the same length, so the lengths cancel out. If we do that, then we know that the units of unit weight are what? Force per meter cubed. Um, and so I, um, actually I'm going to write it out just like that. So it's kilonewtons per meter cubed, so force per meter cubed. And so this is the same as force per unit volume. And so we can think of each of these terms, if we multiply this whole thing through by the unit weight of the fluid multiplied by some length, the length could be z, doesn't matter, then the, the units of this would be force per unit volume. So that's a useful uh, term for us to do. I say that because we're defining these non-dimensional numbers as forces. So if you divide a force per unit volume by a force per unit volume, you end up with the ratio of two forces, which is useful to us. The Navier-Stokes equations that you'd have seen last time, I'll just write out our equations that are written in three equations in three different directions, but they look like this. A rate of, this is the acceleration term, right? This is convective acceleration. Velocity times rate of change of velocity in space. There's a pressure gradient term, dp dx. There is a gravitational term. Sorry, rho g. And there is a viscous term. And so this, these are, this is just one of the Navier-Stokes equations, n, n, n sub s. You can write that in longer term. And so what are the units of this? We can take any particular component, but this is a magnitudes of what? Pressure divided by length. And pressure is equal to force over length squared times length, which is equal to force over volume. And the reason I wrote these out in this way is that each of these terms in this differential equation actually corresponds uniquely to the components that we have in Bernoulli's equation, the one-dimensional form of the energy equation. So this is the energy equation, right, because it has this term in it. And each of these components, this is the inertial component, convective acceleration, trying to accelerate the fluid from some magnitude at some location to a different velocity somewhere else. That's an acceleration. And to accelerate something, we have to apply force to do it. A pressure term, a gravitational term, and a viscous loss term. And the only reason for doing this is that if we want to be able to, uh, to use these, then we can look at the ratio of these individual components to be able to define the behaviors. Before, we don't really have a, a term to define this, but from Navier-Stokes, we know that this term must be like this. This is the component behavior that gives us this length scale. 
It's a function of viscosity, it's a function of velocity, and it's a function of length squared. And so that's, that's the only reason for writing the, the Navier-Stokes equation. So now let's go back to the examples that we've dealt with already in, in class. And uh, if we want to, if you remember, some of the examples that we've used. If you remember um, the submarine, Let's see if I can draw the submarine. Remember, we calculated the pressure that you develop at the face of the submarine. Um, and so that the essence of this problem was in destroying velocity and figuring out what the pressure would be at the tip. And so if we take each of these two components of these two terms, I'm writing it directly under this, and if we write it as equal to the ratio, I'm going to write it as the ratio of pressure divided by unit weight, and I'm going to divide through by this term here, V squared over 2G, which is the same as pressure divided by density and gravity times 2G over V squared. I'm going to get rid of gravity on both sides. I don't care about the factor of 2, and I have a term which is pressure over rho v squared, which is our Euler number. So the ratio in this case of pressure forces to inertial forces is the Euler number. So this is pressure over inertia. So we end up with this important number. If we look at the free jet problem with a velocity coming out of here, well, the flow was really driven by gravitational effects and imparted a velocity to it. And so I'm doing this because I, I know what the results are. So don't <coughs> worry if you can't quite figure out why I'm saying this. But if we take the, re the components that relate to uh, gravity, which is this term here, and flow velocity, and I want something that has, um, so I'm going to take the ratio of inertial forces to gravity, and so my inertial forces are v squared over 2g, my gravity force is equal to uh, 1 over z. And if I just get rid of this and I take the square root, then it's uh, v over square root gz. So I'm just taking the square root of it. I can do whatever I want. I just want to have the ratios of these. Uh, and so I can get rid of the two. Uh, in this particular case. So the important thing are the units that are used. And this, of course, is the Froude number. And so it's useful in terms of looking at free surface flow. And finally, uh, perhaps the most important of these numbers is going to be the one that deals with uh, this problem of pipe flow, which we is this one we alluded to before, that we have some velocity coming out of the pipe. We have some uh, diameter of this pipe. We have a pressure gradient along the length of it, dp. And we like to know what the average velocity is that uh, fluid comes out of it. So clearly there's going to be a term that relates to uh, the velocity that we'd probably like to include. Um, there's also going to be the essence of this problem, as we've alluded to, is this viscous loss term, which would be this component <coughs> here. And actually, there's, there's also 
I'm going to do it here, but I'm going to put a dotted line around it. I guess I can't do a dotted line very well with this thing. So pretend this is a, oh yeah, okay, so dashed line. And so I know this ahead of time. So I want to take these two first. And I want to look at the ratio of those. And what do I want to, to deal with? I, I should look, yeah, okay. So I want to take the ratio, as I said, of uh, inertia to viscous forces. And so this is where I have a bit of a problem. Um, because if I want to directly take this force over volume force, I've neglected the fact that outside this uh, bracket, I've multiplied all these by unit weight over length to get the same units as I have here. So when I use this inertial force here, all the other terms inside the bracket, I'd have been dividing by a term and multiplying by the same term, so I haven't used this, but I have to use this here. So if I look at inertia term, I have V squared over 2G, and it has to be multiplied by this length here, so I'm going to put in unit weight times a length, and just to be consistent, I'm going to use a, a length here. It can be any length. And I'm going to divide it through by the viscous forces, which are this. And so the viscous forces are going to be the top line is a velocity times <coughs> viscosity. So viscosity times visco viscosity times velocity and length squared. And so if I try and simplify that out, what do I get? <laughs> Let me replace this term here as rho g. And then what can I do? I get rid of this length, I can get rid of this length. I've got a velocity here, I get rid of this velocity here. I've got gravity here, I've got gravity here. I don't care about a 2. And so what have I got left? I've got velocity, density, <coughs> some length scale, and viscosity. And this although I don't have much space for it here, is this very important term, Reynolds number. And so, from looking at these just simple behaviors and simple scaling arguments, we've defined what these important uh, terms are. There's another term in here which would be one that links these two, because of course pressure turns up in this somewhere, and this is the same as this term here, so this, not surprisingly, would just be the Euler number. So this is the Reynolds number. And I guess these two together would be the Froude number. And this would be Euler. So when we talk about um, dimensional, non-dimensional parameters that allow us to do dimensional analysis, they will almost always be these uh, for the purposes of this course. There are other ones which are important. Um, there are things like the Weber number, which incorporates interfacial tension and height rise in capillaries, which is really just the same as the capillary number, which some of you will deal with in petroleum engineering, looking at uh, trying to force two fluids through very narrow confines of pore throats. Um, and so the and this Mach number, of course, is a dimensionless number, uh, which, which you'd all be familiar with, probably be familiar with as well. Just the ratio of the velocity you're traveling at relative to the speed of sound. So if you're going at Mach 1, you're traveling at speed of sound. Mach 2, you're going twice the speed of sound. So this is important because it allows us to, to scale between these. And so I guess I'll leave it for next time and where we'll start with this. Uh, the motivation in this would be that maybe... Um, we'd like to be able to figure out, as we said before, we'd like to know exactly what the velocity of flow in this pipe is as a function of the pressure gradient that we apply and the geometry of the pipe and something to do about the physical characteristics such as, for instance, viscosity and maybe density affects it. And so we could do a whole bunch of experiments, keeping some variables constant, using different diameter pipes, using different flow rates, using different fluids. But what we can use dimensional analysis to do is to basically 
figure out the absolute minimum number of experiments we need to run to be able to get the results that we want, which would ultimately allow us to get this, this term here without knowing anything about differential calculus or the Navier-Stokes equations. And so what we'll find is that these important non-dimensional numbers that are the ratios of different uh, forces in the system, which we've kind of defined here, are representative of the behavior of, of the system. Now I'm trying to get it to stop here. And so, just to recap, the Reynolds number will be an index that gives us a snapshot of the flow regime so that if we want to be able to replicate the behavior at a real Reynolds number of something, we need to do an experiment at exactly that same Reynolds number. If we do the experiment at that Reynolds number, we can measure forces that are applied to the structure at that particular velocity, and that will give us an Euler number. And that allows us to scale the forces that are applied on the model to the forces that we'd expect to have applied to the real-life plane that we expect to design for. And so out of these, by far the most two important numbers will be Reynolds number to scale the flow in the first place, and Euler number to be able to, for instance, to find the forces that are applied on the structure. You do an experiment with the, uh, in a wind tunnel with the Sears Tower in it, with all the buildings around it. You measure the forces in the wind tunnel that are applied to the model building of the Sears Tower. How do you scale up that into the forces that will be applied to a life-size building in Chicago? You do it by making sure the experiment is run at the right Reynolds number. You measure the forces on the prototype structure, and you scale them with the velocities in some way to be able to get um, the appropriate pressures that are applied on the full-scale building, and then you can design the structure so it doesn't fall over under those stresses. So that's it. So a very powerful method that we'll use to, to do that. Okay. okay, very good.